Hello. I'm so happy to have you here today. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. We are sitting like so far across from each other at this table. It's all good. You can't tell on video, but we are. Today we're covering lots of things. He came in and I was like, okay, we're going to talk Dick Down in Dallas and mental health. It just like sounds funny because they're so just like almost like polarizing. Yeah. It's funny. I was just talking to a friend on the way over here and uh, he was asking me about like, what happened, you know, when like the song came out, if I signed, he was like, I heard you turned all the labels down and all this stuff. And anyways, we were just talking about it. And he was just like, uh, he was like, well, I hate the song, but he's like real religious. And he was like, but I love you. And he was like, I just want what's best for you and all this stuff. And I was just, you know, I just feel like for me with my story, it's really cool because here you have this song that's, you know, explicit and all this stuff. And it's funny, and it is definitely part of my personality, like, you know, how I met some of the, one of the songwriters, which is now my roommate, is, like, I was in a bar playing cover songs, changing the words to Big Green Tractor to take you for a ride on my big tally whacker. So, like, <laughs> like, that is definitely part of my personality and so much of who I am. But, like, the cool thing about it is is that I am 14 years sober, you know? Yeah. And that it shows... All those people that I got sober with and people that have known me throughout the years. I worked in a drug and alcohol um, treatment center for seven years. You know, I was very very, um, heavily involved in my recovery, other people's recovery. So in that community, a lot of people knew me, you know. And it just goes to show that, like, if you never give up, you don't have to be like a prude or like— you know, to be sober or, you know, to be healthy, you know, be healthy in your you know, mentals. You know, you don't have to be like this saint and like this holy roller. Not that I'm against that, you know. I believe in, you know, Jesus and all that stuff. But, like, it just goes to show that, like, you don't have to, like, follow any certain path, you know. Yeah. And I think it, that it speaks volumes for, you know, it's like, okay, well, I can do whatever I want. You know, it's like these things don't have to handicap me. And that's kind of like the message that, you know, that I try to carry, you know. We talk about that all the time on the show. It's the concept of like both and. Like you don't have to be either or. I think there's so much pressure that you're supposed to like almost niche down to this one mold that like society puts on you. Like you either have to be like super religious and super um, or super like prude and quotes like whatever it is or like more vulgar, whatever it is, it doesn't mean that, like we, I have this thing where I say like breadwinning housewife is a joke, but really, yeah. honestly, the concept is similar. It's like, you can be all of it or you can be none of it. It's like completely up to you, but you don't have to fit someone else's mold of what they expect you to be. Yeah. So I think it's cool. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's go back to your childhood. Where did you grow up? Um, And what, what was like your family dynamic? Um. Well, I grew up in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. So when I was, when I was three, my parents got a divorce. My mom and dad did. Um, so like, I don't ever remember them being married or anything like that. But from age, um, from then on to about age 13, my mom remarried right after that. A guy named Seth and he was my stepdad and up until I was, you know, 13. I mean, he always remained a part of my life, but, um, but my childhood was um, my stepdad and my dad were like coach of my you know my football team like one coach the offense one coach the defense, so I like looking back I always remember having a dad at home and a dad that I went to his house on the weekends so it's like kind of this like co parenting thing going on, um, um which was you know that was my normal you know, looking back it's kind of weird you know. <laughs> No, that's but, healthy. Uh, that's good. Yeah, it was kind of good. Um, and then one day I, my mom checked me and my sister out of school, and she was just like, um, me and Seth aren't getting along. We're moving out tomorrow. Um, so How that, old were you? 13. Okay. Or 12, 12 or 13. I was like about to go to ninth grade, like, you know, junior high. Yeah. No, freshman in high school. How and do you then, feel like that's affected you? I don't think it affects me anymore, but it did affect me then. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, you know, and I was, you know, me and my mom are super close and, and 
one thing that I've learned to deal with is that stuff and, and, you know, my past and, and, um, you know, I, I, one, one, the biggest thing for me was realizing that your parents are people too, you know, and they do the best that they can. Um, so I don't like holding any grudges or anything there anymore. I don't think I just started in, with a new therapist, uh, two days ago and, uh, and we talked about all that stuff. So I don't know. We might have to dig back into it. It's always just yeah. like every time I go to a new therapist or like I'm always digging right back into my childhood, you know? Yeah, same. It's like it never goes away. You're always like, yeah. you're always going to go back into it because those are like the first things that ever happened to you that set the ball rolling for the, you know, for a lot of the stuff and the way that you work, you know, your mind. Your childhood affects so much. Yeah. I've been in therapy like most of my life and I like, I'm circling back to things that I like. I feel like I've already, I, I can't talk about that anymore. I'm so over it, yeah. you know. Yeah. But it always comes back. Are you into attachment theory at all? Have you ever looked into that? Uh-uh. Uh, I heard about this thing called uh, uh, trauma trauma bond. Yes. Have you heard of that? Yes. Just the concept of trauma bonding. Yeah. Just yeah. like um, my therapist laid it on me. I mean, I've done. I've been around mental health for, you know, most of my life. And I don't know why. I've, I guess I've heard of it. I just never thought of it, you know? Yeah, it's just like it was, a, it, I think it's something I'm more weary of. I see it all the time on, like, mental health Instagram pages, yeah. actually. But yeah, just I the mean, concept I, of I read it. this, like, article, and I read this book on the way here up on the bus about it. And it's like, damn, I've been on both sides of this, you know, in some form or fashion, always. So You're very self-aware. Yeah. I work on it. I mean, that's good. I just feel like in in my world that I live in, like I'm always like constantly like being told no, you know. Especially, I mean, up until Dick Down in Dallas, you know, my music career was a joke, <laughs> you know. Like, I mean, I, when I went home on Thanksgiving or you know Christmas, people are like, "You still doing that music thing, boy? You know, you gonna get a real job, you know?" Or like. All my, you know, all my friends and stuff that are talking about their fucking 401ks and, you know, all that stuff. So, like, up until that, at this point, it hasn't really been a real success story, you know. So, I feel like if you're constantly being told no or that's not good enough, like, you constantly having to look at yourself and constantly having to rebuild, you know, like, go back and redefine everything, you know. So, like... I don't know. I feel like AA. I went to AA. That's how I got sober. We can get into that. But um, but it kind of taught me to do that, you know, just to constantly be self-aware. And sometimes it's it's not always a good thing for me um, because I've always been – I've taught – I've taught myself and my brain how to always just look at my part. What can I change? And a lot of times I, I'm too hard on myself, if that makes sense. You know? Yes. So – um, I'm self-aware, but you know, I'm fucked up too. So. Pros and cons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's go into AA and your sobriety. At what point, like, can you just take us through that process? Yeah. So after my parent, my mom and my stepdad got divorced, we moved from like, I grew up in Vestavia. So it's like fucking suburbs, you know, it's mm-hmm. like super nice, but we moved from that part of town, same city, same school, didn't have to change schools, but to, like, the poor side of town, which is not that poor, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was a big deal to me, and I think that's the, you know, the deal that I'm getting at. So we moved over there, and um, we, like, lived in this townhouse, and I didn't have any of my friends. And I'll just never forget, like, I believe that this is when my isolation began. You know, it's like, I just, like, I remember just, like, every day, like, I would just, like, be riding my bike, and I would just, like, throw it down and just cry. I just felt so alone, you know? And, um, but one day I was in this video store. It was like, it's called Hollywood video. It was like, it was like a, um, like blockbuster. Yeah. Like blockbuster or whatever. Man. Um, I see my friend from my old neighborhood in there. I'm like, what's up dude. And he was like, man, I'm just in here renting a movie with my mom. And, uh, He's like, we're we're moving over here. So like, he moved over there, and I had my best friend back, and you know, we started skateboarding. And then um, I have a sister two years older than me. I actually have stepbrothers and all that stuff, but my sister lived with us, and um, 
I don't know. There was it's very shadowy. I don't know if I buried a lot of stuff in my mind or whatever, but I remember nights of just like being in my house and um waking up and like the cops being there or like basically my sister was like doing drugs and cussing out my mom, you know. Yeah. And then um but I just remember being like, I'll never do drugs, you know, like look what it's done to my family and my mom and all that stuff and um but uh I was hanging out with my friends, my friend that from my old neighborhood, his name's Frankie. He's my best friend. We've we've we're still friends to this day. Like anything I've ever been through in my life, um, he's always been there. And it's actually funny, um, my agent that books my shows at, at WME, him and my best and my best friend are like first cousins. Oh really? Yeah. And it just Small like world. happened like it was total freak accident. So yeah. um but anyways so we're me and Frankie are hanging out. We start making other friends. We're like skateboarding and all this stuff. We're like smoking cigarettes and like, you know, just rebellious stuff. And um, I'll never forget. Like I said, well, I'm not gonna do drugs, but I can drink because you know, normal people drink. My parents drink. And the first time I ever got drunk, I it was it was a very important day of my life. I remember everything like. Down to what I was wearing and what I ended up not wearing that night. You know, I ended up like in my underwear walking down the street because I couldn't tell my dad how to come get me. I was to pick me up at the Pizza Hut in my whitey tidies, you know. <laughs> old were you? Uh, 13. Okay, young. So, yeah, real young. But um, it when I took that first sip of alcohol, things changed for me. And, and um, it just changed who I was as a person. I feel like it was like. I found that thing that was always missing, you know, and I just, um, I, I, that's all I could think about. Like school, it was like, whose older brother's going to buy me beer, you know, or like, how am I going to get alcohol, you know? And the first time I ever got drunk, I drank nine beers. My buddy drank eight. And then the kid that drank four beers got sick and threw up. And, you know, for the longest time, I blamed it on him for throwing up because I smelled his throw up. That's why I got sick. Not because I drank nine beers, yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so um, so I did that. And then, um, I, I, you know, I got in a little bit of trouble, but not really. You know, I, I cried my way out of it. I learned how to manipulate early on. And I was just like, in the back of my mind, I was like, as soon as I can get away with that again, I'm going to do it, you know. And, uh, I mean, it just became like an every weekend thing, you know, I just, you know, anytime I could get away with it, I got drunk, you know, and, and for me getting drunk was like throwing up was just part of it, you know, for a long time. Um, but anyway, so we rock on for a little while and then I was like, well, I mean, I guess I could smoke some pot. It's not that big of a deal, you know, and then I smoked pot and then that's just kind of how my alcoholism and addiction um progressed it was like well i said i wouldn't do pills but let's do some pills you know and then when i got into ninth grade i started selling drugs and that's when everything just kind of went crazy 10th i dropped out in ninth grade i did homeschool for a year went back to high school in 10th grade and then 10th i did pretty well and then 10th grade summer i did a bunch of like acid and mushrooms hallucinogenics you know and then uh, I went back to school, and my brain was just, like, fried. And then uh, I had a drug deal gone bad in my house. One of my good friends got beat up really bad, and the cops found out, and the school found out, and all that stuff. And uh, I was just, like, at that point, I got pretty good at running, you know, just, like, screw this, I'm out. So I uh, I, I dropped out and stayed out. And... um Went to military school for a little while. I got hopped up on cocaine one night, and I called my dad. I was like, Dad, this would be a great idea, man. Let's go to military school, get my life together, you know. <laughs> and uh, I go to military school. I had, like, by the time I was 17, I had a felony uh, DUI and felony um, uh, marijuana possession, cocaine. I mean, I had, like, three felonies. It was crazy. And uh, so I went to military school. The day after my court stuff got thrown out, I got kicked out of military school. So here I am. I'm coming home. You know, ain't got no court stuff on my back. 
my parents am not welcome at home, but they like bought me this support, uh, apartment. And that was one thing that like, you know, finally made me get it together. My parents stopped loving me to death. You know, they finally quit bailing me out of trouble. But when I, I got this apartment and then I went to, after that, I went to Tuscaloosa cause all my friends were going to school down there and uh, I ended up getting arrested again down there. Um, and I'll never forget being in jail and I was in there for like 30 days and you get your turn to call, you know, you get your phone call. I don't, I don't, I doubt you ever been to jail, but I'm just telling you, <laughs> you, everybody gets a phone call and I call, I mean, I go to the phone and like, I just want to call one person in my life that could just tell me for once that I was like a good person or did something good. And I'll just never forget that feeling in my stomach. It's just there was nobody to call because I'd screwed everybody over, you know, and it was it was a uh, it was a terrible feeling. But even still, when I got out of there, I got drunk again, you know, and I went crazy for another three months. And then finally, I called my mom and I said, "Mom, I'm ready to get help." But at this point, you know, I wasn't welcome at home. I didn't have, you know, um, even I would couch surf and people would like kick me out of there, you know. So it was like I finally. At 19, was willing enough to, you know, do whatever I needed to to, you know, get my life together. And I didn't know anything about alcoholism or really anything about life, you know. Um, and I remember going to treatment thinking, hell, if I could just go here for a little while, learn to drink responsibly, I'll get me another apartment in Tuscaloosa and roll tide, baby, you know. <laughs> and uh, that, just, that just didn't work out. So I was in treatment. I'm just going to keep going here with the story yeah, if you want going, me to. Keep cool. going. So I was in treatment and um, I'm, uh, I'm there and I didn't, you know, I didn't like get up when they told me to or really do anything that, you know, that they suggested. Other what than did that. they ask you to do in treatment? Well, like, you have to get up early and you have to like share and like <laughs> do all this stuff and like. I don't know. I ain't, t you know, I ain't yeah. talking about my feelings. That's weird, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, anyways, it took me a couple of days, but I'll never forget. It's pretty cool in treatment. They do this thing where there's like, it's the group of, you know, the cottage mates or whatever. There's a counselor here and there's a counselor here. And these people start sharing about their lives. And this guy starts talking about his dad. And how him and his dad aren't that close and, you know, all this stuff. And he's just telling my story, you know, like I've heard it, you know, like that he's telling my story word for word. And I don't even know this guy, yeah. you know, and I don't know what it was that day. I cried like I haven't cried in years. Like I'm not talking about like cry to like get, you know, attention or get something that I wanted or whatever, like it's a real cry, like snot boogers flying everywhere, you know? And, um, I don't know. That was like a day where I just realized that, wow, I really got to like do something different here. You know, like if I get out of here and I don't, you know, if I do what I always done, I'm going to get what I've always gotten. And like my, um, me and my dad's relationship was screwed up because of my drug addiction and alcoholism. I mean, I, I like stole money from him. He sent me to that military school. I got kicked out, you know, all that stuff. So, um, I, you know, I, I started to have that realization. And then I got a letter from my mom while I was in treatment that said, you can't come home until your court date or your sentencing. I was like, uh, you know, they've been trying to pitch me this halfway house called uh, Teen Challenge, and I was like, I read the pamphlet, and they're like, you can't cuss, you can't smoke cigarettes. I was like, well, I'm just going to tell you right now, I ain't going to make it, you know? <laughs> they're going to kick me out second day. And uh, they told me about this place called Any Length Resources in Bessemer, Alabama. And uh, at this point in my life, I'd never – I grew up Church of Christ. Um, Is and, that Christian? Yeah, okay. yeah. And, and, and like, I – um, knew who God was, you know, yeah. and I, you know, I guess I believed in God, but like, I never saw the necessity for a relationship with a higher power. 
Like, I thought it was just something that you did with your family on Sundays and Wednesdays and whenever, you know. And then when I – I'll never forget, um, we – at the end of the day, you circle up and you say the Lord's Prayer, like the Serenity Prayer, and you do it like 10 times a day in treatment. And um, I don't know. It's weird. Everybody in rehab finds Jesus, you know? Like my my roommate was like a preacher, and then I had this other guy. His name was Wayne. He was just like always like, the good Lord this. And like <laughs> everybody was like, if anybody's going to make it, it's going to be Wayne, you know, because he was just like Mr. Pro Recovery. Um but uh, anyways, um, after prayer one day, Wayne and my roommate approached me and was like, man, we were just kind of noticing how, like, you know, after your, uh, after prayer, how you uh, how you just don't say the prayers or anything like that. We were just wondering what's up with you, you know? And I was like, well, I was like, uh, I don't know the prayers because I never knew them, you know? Yeah. And, um. I don't know, we did this thing where, like, we went in the room and, like, we held hands and, like, we read the Bible. And then he was like, repeat after me, you know? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Wayne is, like, over there the whole time going, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, <laughs> Jesus, amen. And I was like, Wayne, dude, you're going to have to chill out. I can't, I can't even think on what this guy's saying. I'm just trying to do this. So we did that. That was an odd experience. I don't know why I told that story, but. I was guess that the it Lord's was, Prayer? Uh, no, it was just like, I guess, what, however you get saved whatever. or whatever. Yeah, you okay. ask the Lord into your heart. Yeah, yeah. But um, I don't know if that meant anything, you know? I mean, it meant something to me. It was sincere. I wanted, I was, that was my first time of ever, to like, trying to reach something spiritual or something, you know, in the sky or something other than beyond myself, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I remember going back to my room that night and just being like, well... You know, I don't know if that meant anything, but the next day I woke up and I was like, um, there was no burning bush or anything like yeah. that, you know, but the next day I woke up and I was like, fuck, I leave here in two days. I got to figure out where I'm going. And I, and I shared about it in group. I started opening it up and, uh, somebody said to me, was like, have you tried praying about it? And I was like, no, nah. you know, so I went in my room. At this point, I'm still, you know, skeptic of the whole thing. I'm just like, God, I don't know if you're real or, you know, if I'm just sitting here and talking to walls, but I really need some fucking help. I don't know where I'm going. Like, if you could just help me, that would be awesome. I got up off my knees. I went to my counselor's door. I knocked on the door. And I said, Trey, I was just about to come get you. We got to call this guy down here in ALR. I called the guy. His name's Robbie Keevil. He's a, he saved my life. And, uh. He picked me up from, he said, I'll be there to pick you up from rehab. He picked me up. He took me to the halfway house. He put me in the smaller one because he didn't want me to be in the big community. I had an old friend at the, at the other place. And, um, yeah. And I, and I got to this sober living and there was a bunch of other guys there that were way older than me. And at first, you know, I've, I've always kind of been, you know, it's just like I was like, well, I'm not that bad. You know, I was I'm 19 years old. I didn't smoke crack or do a lot of those crazy things that they were talking about on, um, on social media or not on social media, but on um, on the detox porch. You know, at rehab, um, I probably can just like live here, go to some meetings, and I don't need to get a sponsor or work the steps or anything like that. So, eventually. I got to a point to where I was calling all my friends in Tuscaloosa being like, man, I get 30 days here soon. And we'll come down there. We're going to get drunk and then we'll come back. We're not going to tell anybody, you know? Well, I use drugs and I drank alcohol. I mean, I use drugs and I, yeah. And I, and I drank alcohol every day. Like it was nonstop. And to obsess about it and not be able to do it, for 30 days is a long time for somebody like me, you know? And I'll never forget reaching that point. And I always say this, that it was my, my sobriety because I definitely wasn't sober. I was just dry. And, um, just reaching that point of mental exhaustion of just like, it was my breaking point. It was my bottom, you know? And I remember walking into the guy that ran the sober living. His name was Steve. And I said, Steve, uh, man, I think I'm ready to 
do whatever it takes to like if I need to get a sponsor or whatever the hell y'all are telling me because I keep having this plan to go down to Tuscaloosa and get drunk with my friends. And he was like, he's like this old guy. He's like, here's the deal, Trey. <laughs> You're either going to do this or you going to pack your shit and get the fuck out of here. I was like, well, man, I, I really want to do it, you know? And he like t- tore a piece of paper off and wrote this number down. He's like, this guy's name's Nick. Call him. He's your sponsor. Man, I called that guy and, you know, we started working the steps and, we got all the way to like step nine, you know, where you go back and, and apologize or where, you know, make your amends. And, uh, he relapsed. Wow. So that was a very pivotal moment in my, my sobriety. I'll never forget. I was six months sober and I also heard don't get in a relationship in your first year of recovery or like, um, at least don't have sex with anybody until you're like, until you're, you know, work past your night step. Or is it people you work... in general or is it people that you met in rehab? It's people like... in general. Okay, got it. So I know people that have followed that advice. I know people that haven't. I don't think it makes a difference either way. You know, it's just how much can you take mentally? You know what I mean? Yeah. What are your What are your intentions? You know what I mean? Like if that's some, if sex is something that triggers you, then, you know, it's like probably yeah. not something you need to do. But anyways... I all I, my mind heard was is all you gotta do is work the steps and then you can go have sex. So like, I was six months sober. I'd worked all I'd worked the first nine steps. Like I was good, and but like I started chasing women like crazy, you know. And and not that I found any contenders yet, but like I was trying, you know. <laughs> putting and, in a uh, good effort. Yeah, yes. I was putting in a good effort, and uh, I met this. I knew this girl from back in the day, up in Pell City, and and we were hanging out. And uh, I'd kind of quit going to meetings. I had this big book study that I'd been doing for like nine months that I'd kind of quit going to. Then I'll never forget, like, me and that girl hooked up. I can talk about that on here, right? Yeah. And I was like, two pump chump. I mean, it was like, <laughs> it was embarrassing, you know? <laughs> but I just yeah. remember the feeling of actually just feeling so empty inside, not, yeah. you know, I mean, literally, and you know, but <laughs> I just remember like leaving there and like, I remember sitting in my car and looking down at my six month key, you know, my key tag and thinking, I was like, damn, right now would be a perfect time to get high, you know, or I could just go back to that meeting that I've been going to and, you know, get, get that toothless guy that I met a few weeks ago to be my sponsor. My, My second sponsor had like three teeth when I met him, but he had all his teeth by the time, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but uh so i drove back as fast as i could to birmingham and went to that meeting i went in there and talked to that guy asked him to be my sponsor and that's when i really like dug into the program of aa and that's really when i like you know i finished my steps i started sponsoring other men um me and my sponsor we would go to up to bradford every night every monday night we would take a meeting up there and you know i'll sponsor like five six guys at a time and 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 you know, uh, several meetings a week, going to treatment centers to speak, just on fire for my recovery. And, and, and that's when I really started to grow the most. And, um, when, but I, when I was about nine months sober, I bought a guitar. I moved out of the halfway house. I lived with my dad for a little while. You know, I, I mentioned before that me and my dad's relationship was screwed up and that relationship came together. And I lived with my dad for about six months and then I got my own place. Um, and me and my dad were super close. My dad died when I was 26 of a massive heart attack. So we had seven years of best friendship, you know, and I honestly wouldn't have it any other way, you know, but when he died, that caused some trauma and, you know, I've had to deal with that over the years. I mean, that was, that was a tough time. I mean, just somebody die like out of the blue, you know, Horrible. but my, you know, my dad dying was um, was like the start of a lot of people dying in my life, and then, um, but uh, back to my sobriety. So I'm like, I get my own place. Um, I've got a job. I'm making smoothies. I'm playing guitar for fun, um, just a hobby, you know. I'm going back and forth to Nashville to like record some songs. Nothing, nothing too serious. Just knew a guy that had a studio up there, but it it started the you know the dream you know yeah and um 
uh, I'll never forget, I was up, I had a sponsee that was in a rock and roll band, and he knew this guy at a studio in Nashville, and I was up, I was kind of being like his, his sponsor, just going with him, and uh, his producer asked me to play something. I played one of my terrible songs, and I sang, he's like, dude, you got a hell of a voice, and I was like, thanks, man. Well, he called me a few weeks later and was like, man, if you come up to Nashville, I'll record your EP for free, and we'll try to get your record deal, whatever. So I was like, I talked to my family about it. I went back and got my GED, and I was taking some college classes. I got the job at Bradford Treatment Center, and uh, life was going good, you know? So, like, I had to really ask my family, like, do you think this is a cool thing to do, go up here? They were like, fuck yeah, do it, you know? But, like, that was the first time in my life that I actually had some stability that I built, you know, yeah. myself. So, like, it was scary for me to, like, make that move, you know. But anyway, It feels like a bigger risk. Yeah. Do you feel like before with, you know, using alcohol, drugs, whatever it was, it felt like you were almost, like, not even just running from problems, but just trying to avoid them at all costs? Of course. Do you feel like once you got sober and then you started in music that that was like a different way of like channeling once you had obviously grown so much emotionally of like yeah. channeling your emotions? Oh, for sure. And yeah. it still is, you know. Um, I feel like I'm I'm lucky in a sense to have um, several outlets today, you know. Wait, what are your other ones? Well, my other outlet is I have the inventory process that AA AA gives me, you know. Cool. And I can I can use that to like deal with things in a healthy manner, you know. See my part. Where was I selfish? Where was I dishonest? Where was I can in, inconsiderate? What can I do better? Do I need to apologize to this person? Do I need to do this? You know. If your like sixteen year old self heard you saying this stuff now, yeah, would you ever have believed that that would be you now? No, because I mean I'm from the south, you know, yeah. and and men don't talk about their problems, you which know? is why I like really wanted to have you on because yeah. I can tell you, I mean, you talking about this honestly, I know people that I'm like that's the road that I see. Mm -hmm. And it's really sad. Like, I've dealt with mental health so much. But I think, you know, mental health is a taboo topic regardless. Yeah. Girls just typically, not to generalize, but girls just typically open up easier and talk more about their feelings. And guys don't. Yeah. And, and then the only time I think a guy really does is, like, with someone where he's, like, romantically involved with at some point. Yeah. And it's scary. Like, what advice, what would you tell someone who's, like, in their 20s? drinking way too much avoiding all their problems like what would you say to them now oh i don't know um i don't know i mean it's it's a hard thing to tell somebody i'm not gonna i mean the only reason i mean then this might sound screwed up but the only reason i am the way i am is because i screwed up my life so much you mm -hmm. know what i mean and i'm grateful for it you know what i mean like the awareness that i have now in the in the in the in the um you know the things I have to process, the emotions. I'm grateful for them, but I don't. I don't know. You know, I had to get to a certain point to where I was like, I can't live like this. Yeah. You know. So if somebody's at that point, you know, or they feel like they can't live that way, you know, then there's always options out there. You know, there's people like me to talk to, and you know, I'm not somebody. I'm not special or anything. You know, everybody's. You know, there's plenty of people out there to talk to. You know, and, and a lot of the times. All you have to do is just hear yourself talk, yeah. you know, because a lot of times, I, I mean, even today, I'll be driving down the road and I'll just have a conversation with God. And then I have this realization that what I'm stressing out about ain't even something to stress out about. But sometimes you just like sometimes, you know, if you don't want to talk to somebody, you can just journal, you know, and like sometimes all that stuff just comes out when you. But I think it's the effort of actually trying to do something different from what you're doing. You know? Do you think you even knew the problems that you were facing or trying to not face during that time? Like, did you know actively that you were trying to run away or you were trying to not deal with, like, a divorce or whatever it was, like, heartbreak or whatever that might be? Or did it take, like, getting sober to realize that, like, oh, these actually hurt me a lot worse than I thought? Um, it took me actually getting sober. A lot of my childhood stuff, I didn't ever really— I mean, there was things that happened in my childhood, you know. I mean, I, when I was molested when I was younger, and I didn't even remember that until I was, like, two or three years sober. Yeah. You know? So there's, like, a lot of things that um, that I kind of blocked out, you know. 
But as far as like divorce goes, I did that shit sober. You know, mm -hmm. I got married sober. I got divorced sober. You know, um, you know, I, I mentioned my my dad died, my grandmother died, my stepdad that pretty much raised me died. You know, I had a stepson when I was married. I'm not in his life anymore. You know, so I've had to deal with shit sober that's been just as hard as dealing with, you know, if I was drunk or not. You yeah. Know? Um, I think that, you know, if if alcohol was still a coping mechanism, you know, um, I would definitely not be here, you know. Yeah. And that's the thing is that I feel like drugs and alcohol worked for me for a little while until they didn't, you know. And um, so, yeah. It's a really cool story. I also just, again, like that you're so open about it because there's not many men, I feel like, who are. I mean, I know there are, but yeah. not as much, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely... Um, I definitely have, a, like, a few, like, go-to friends that I can really, really dig yeah. in there with and really talk to. I have this one friend um, that I've known for some years. Um, I actually sponsored him to get sober, but now we're just, like, friends. We mm -hmm. just have dinner every now and then or talk. But we can just go for hours just on just, like, how deep it really gets, you know? Yeah, that's really and, cool. And it's really cool, but, um, yeah, it, it's... um. It's cool. I mean, to be able to talk about your feelings or like really just own up to like things that you're doing, you know, mm -hmm. that's it's, a lot of the times is like a lot of people don't want to own up to their weaknesses, you know? Yeah. And also like makes you human. It makes you a lot like your relationships can get a lot deeper. Yeah. For sure. I want to talk about music. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier how you felt like you've just gotten so many no's and you're at home. People are like, oh, you're still doing that music thing. Like what? kept you going you know before like dick down in dallas blew up yeah. what was like your driving force at that time i just loved it and, how many uh, years was it too give us like an actual ten. timeline okay ten. cool so my dad always told me he said um son i'm an accountant i hate my job do what you love mm -hmm. and he used to always say too um to always say uh I just know music's going to work out for you. Just always do it, no matter what. So there's a lot of that plays in it. My daddy issues play into it a little bit. But uh, the other part that plays into it is that I just love it. You know? I just, um, I remember getting sober and picking up that guitar, and I knew how to play a G chord, and just playing it downstairs in my dad's basement, and just being like, oh. Like, just that, I don't know. It just, there's no way, other way to explain it. Like, it felt like a drug, and maybe it is, you know? And it just made me feel something in my soul. And um, other than I just, I mean, I just I just straight up love it. I mean, we, you know, I've had the same band. I've had the same guitar player and drummer for one. My drummer's been there for five. My guitar player's been there for eight. And, I mean, you know, we played four-hour cover gigs for four hours straight, four nights a week, and, you know, I took a lot of pride in that, and, and you know, um, I think the thing is is that I just stuck with it because I knew that, I didn't know if it would ever work out, but I knew that I loved it enough at the level that I was doing it at. If that was all I ever did, then I was okay with that. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was riding in my van, the white van that's in Dick Down, that's really my car. Mm -hmm. I was riding in my white van, and I was talking to God one morning. I said, God, if all you ever want me to do is is write songs with my friends and play cover gigs on the weekends, then I'm fine with that. That's what I want. That's what I'll do. But fuck you. That's what you know. That's what I told him. I was like, I said, wouldn't it be cool just to have a little bit of success to show people that if you never give up, that you know things work out. Yeah. I was like, I don't know, but that's all I'm saying. You know? gonna get it me, but like, that's how I talk to God because yeah. I mean, it's just like, you know, how you know, and people might say say that screwed up, but like, it's God, not. God knows us best. You know yeah. how how are you going to talk to something or somebody that you know, um, that knows you best, and you you're going to fake and it, and you're going to fake it, yeah. you know, and and I mean, I've I've done that, you know. I've, you know, I've gone through times where I didn't pray at all, you know, in my sobriety. Um, 
years, you know, so um, now I just get honest with them, you know, and, and I think that that's the biggest thing is it's just like just honesty and being transparent, not with everybody, but people you trust, you know. Yeah. Um, but I uh, but I just stuck with it, and uh, I'll never forget when that song came out and went number one at the top of my charts, surrounded by all my friends. I just went in my room. I just I said, guys, I need a minute. Went in my room, and I got on my knees. I said, God, I'll never question you again. I'm sorry. I mean, which I will question but again. Yeah. Because, you know. But in the moment. But in the moment, yeah. I want to talk about, like, when did you get the idea? What was the whole process of the song? When was yeah. it released? Like, I want the behind the scenes. Okay. So what happened was is, um, I guess it was September of last year. Um, well, let's get the whole backstory. So... I used to play at this place in Auburn called Sky Bar. And there's another bar there called Moe's. It's like Moe's Barbecue. My friend Matt McKinney, which we weren't friends at the time, was playing at Moe's. And everybody knows that when you play Moe's, you walk to Sky Bar afterwards because Sky Bar is the littiest bar in Auburn, you know? <laughs> so um, I'm playing at Sky Bar, and he walks in, and I'm on stage changing the words to Big Green Tractor to the Big, the big Tally Whacker story. Uh -huh. And uh, he comes up, shakes my hand. He's like, I'm Matt. Nice to meet you, man. That was pretty funny. You know, whatever. All right, so um, I got a divorce in, I guess, 17 or whatever when I was 30. I moved to Nashville because I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to – I'm 30 years old. I'm just going to – I'm going to try this Nashville thing out, see what happens. Who knows? And um, – I moved to Nashville, and I met Revival one night. It's like this round that they have. It's like a church pew, and people get up and play songs. And uh, Matt McKinney walks up to me. He's the he's the guy from Sky Bar. He said, dude, I met you that night. You were changing the words to drink in my hand, to dick in my hand. Man, that was hilarious. Like, And he was like one of the first five hands that I shook in Nashville. And me and him instantly became best friends. Well, you know, we both write songs. We write with different people. We wrote together some. But one day, like, I guess like a year into it, he showed me the song that he wrote, like a verse and a course to called Dig Down in Dallas. And I was like, that's funny. Didn't think anything of it. Anyways, he ended up finishing it. So I'm not a writer on the song. It was Brent Gafford, Matt McKinney, and Drew Trosclair. They finished the song. And one day, like during quarantine, um, me, McKinney, and Mitch Wallace, um, and a few other people were going to, not that you know any of these people, but I'm just name dropping on your podcast because <laughs> whatever, you know, but we go to Chili's and we're coming back. I from love Ch Chili's. Right. Like, literally my favorite just restaurant. I'm here. not kidding. Yeah. Yeah. So we're fucking leaving Chili's and, uh, I was on uh busing with the boys and he was giving me shit for going to Chili's, but he was <laughs> like, whatever. I'm so I'm glad you like Chili's. Yeah. So we're leaving Chili's. And uh, we're listening to, like, the voice memo of Dick Down in Dallas. And I was just sitting there. I was like, you know, man, I've been putting out music since 2012, McKinney. Like, you know, McKinney grew up in the ministry. Like, he's never going to put that song out. The other songwriters in a, in a duo with his wife, Charlotte Pike, they've been on the road with us and stuff before, but they're never going to put out the song. And the other guy's just a guitar player. He's never going to put it out. I was like, dude, I've been putting out music since 2012. Nobody ever gave a shit. Fuck it, I'll put it out. So I go home and learn it. It and and during quarantine, we weren't we couldn't go out to the bars anymore. So we all just hung out at each other's houses in Nashville, had bonfires, you know. But uh anyways, we were um I was playing around the campfire. Well, Matt Burrill, my tour manager, which is now my tour manager, he has a podcast called In the Round Podcast, and they do a round in Nashville. And he was like, dude, I want you to come play In the Round. I want you to play your songs because your songs are awesome. But then at the end, I want you to play Dick Down in Dallas. So I get up there and play my songs, play Dick Down in Dallas. By this time, the whole our whole community knows the song because we've been hanging out at each other's houses. So Nicky T takes this video. He has Raised Rowdy. It's like a platform for country music. And um, he takes a video of it and puts it on Facebook. And then from there, Trey Bonner, the guy that does my film and, and stuff, um, my social media, gets it put on Caller Daddy's Facebook group. And then from Oh, I didn't even know it was on yeah, Caller Daddy. Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. It's on, our, on their Facebook like, page thing. And then from there, Matt McKinney got it put on Old Row. And then I started yeah. posting videos of it on TikTok. And then we went to the studio... Um, and recorded the song and Trey Bonner came out and filmed some video and we played, we did like a blind reaction for this guy 
that had heard the song in, in the studio. And I'll never forget, I was driving down to Huntsville to play a four-hour cover gig. And I posted the video on the way down there. And then when I got done, the video had like three million views. That's insane. Yeah, on TikTok. And then we went and did the reaction videos where we just like, which you can find those on YouTube, um, where we just walked up to people and like, I was like, hey man, can I play you this song? And then I play it for them. And there was this one where these guys were just like going crazy. They're like, oh, no, Dick Dan and Dally. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. But it really uh, is. It's just such a catchy song. Like yeah. you can't not like it's we were in Austin. We had like a girls weekend and then my friends of four, like everyone had been playing that song. I honestly, until I asked you to come on the podcast, I didn't realize it had gone viral on TikTok. Yeah. I just thought it was the song my friends showed me. Like I didn't realize the back before I was prepping for this episode. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that was so fast. Yeah. Also, Call Her Daddy is a great, it's a yeah. great plug. Yeah. Um, so we, we, um, yeah, we put the song out, came out December 1st. We went from no nut November to December 1st, you know, Yeah. and, and it came out and there was like, I don't know, it was like 7,000 pre-downloads. So it like stayed at number one for like two weeks on the iTunes charts. Wow. We start this tour. We're touring like crazy. Um, you know, I'm taking meetings with every agent. And with every record label in Nashville and everything, ended up not signing with any of them. So, Why do you not want to sign with a label? Uh, I do want to sign with okay. a label. I want to sign a label, though, based on who I am as an artist and not for one song. Because Got that it. song's never going to go to radio, you know? Yeah. I would rather own the master for that and keep all that money. Yeah, you know? that makes sense. You know, you have a podcast. You know all about the, yeah, the spins. Yeah. yeah. So... I do own that master, and it's been very beneficial to me and the people surrounded, you know, that are in my camp. And uh, it's allowed me to do things that I wasn't ever able to do before as far as, like, putting more content out and, and um, you know, having a team behind me and everything. So it's been nice. So I'm not anti-record label at all. I mean, my, one of my biggest dreams is to play the Grand Ole Opry and have a number one song on the radio, but, like, I'm not going to do it you know, at the cost of giving somebody all everything, you know what yeah. I mean? Of me going broke. It's not gonna happen. Yeah, you know? I'm smart. Um, so and and a lot of that is me being thirty three thirty three, almost thirty four years old, you know? Wisdom. Yeah. Much smarter. I mean, game. that's why I'm like, you know, I remember when I first moved to Nashville, I was like, Fuck, I'm thirty, you know, all my friends are twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. I'm you know, I'm I'm an old man playing a young man's game. I, I don't even know what I'm doing here. Like, you know, I should have never got married, you know. Just my whole life's been a waste, you know. I mean, I, I got sober and I fucked my whole life up, you know. And that's what I mean, that's really, you know, the kind of things that I thought a lot of the times, you know, and and then something like that happens and then your whole overnight overnight and your whole world changes and it's like, oh, okay. So it was it wasn't all for nothing, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, it was actually for something. And uh, my one thing my sponsor used to tell me all the time, I'd call him freaking out about if I was going to get this gig or that gig or you know whatever. And he was like, "Man, just be patient. God's building you. God's building you." And that, I mean, that's true. I mean, that's what he was doing. You know, I'm 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 a lot older now than than I was. You know, if I sign a contract and I'm seven years in, well, damn, I'll be forty something by then. You know, so. It just has to be – I feel like Nashville is signing songs right now because of the world we're living in with social media. Like, social media is the greatest thing that ever happened for me. Do you think radio play matters still? Like, I, I know nothing. Like, does uh, that I matter so. over yeah. social or does social matter over radio? I think so. I mean, M Matt Burrell, my tour manager, would say radio is going away, but I think it's still, still, matters. still a thing. Yeah, it's definitely still a thing. I mean, I want to be on a tour with a major artist, you know. And, What's your and, dream tour? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, do you have like a dream collaboration? I don't. I just, I just want my own, I just want my own tour. I want to sell out yeah. arenas myself. You know yeah. what I mean? I think that's my dream thing. And then like bring up people that I believe in, you know what I mean? Have people like, like we do now, like we had Stephen Paul out with us. He's one of our good buddies from Nashville. Like, you know, we brought him to Texas with us for three days, you know, 
like we're not playing arenas or anything but we're playing in front of people and that gets his music in front of people like i do that with there's this other girl her name's ella langley i don't know if you've heard of her mm -hmm. she's uh she's my roommate she had a song go viral on tiktok recently it actually came out last night wait what song is it it's called hate me if you have to was the video of her like on stage far away well, you uh, actually wouldn't know this because no. this is a i'll send it to you okay, yeah, please she's do. in her car but um but anyways like i'll bring her out on the road um you know i bring a lot of you know pe just people that i believe in that i think are awesome bring them out on the road and and let them play for you know how many ever people we're playing for and that's like my dream is is just to like eventually get to a point to where you know, at whatever level we can do it is that I can bring up people that are that are around me and, and people that have been with me from the very get go. You know, loyalty yeah. is is a big big part of who I am and everything. So Well. Well, thank you so much for coming yeah, on the show. For sure. You were such a great guest. You have such an interesting life, but also I don't know, I just think another thing I was going to say was when you were saying like, Oh, I wasted away my life, I'm thirty now, whatever. I love listening to any podcast where it's someone who's like even in their 40s talking about how they had no idea what they were doing even at 30 because there's yeah. so much of a pressure to feel like you have to have everything figured out at like literally 18 these days so it's like really refreshing when people come in and they're like hey it actually did work out and yeah. i you know messed up here i messed up here but i figured it out so it's actually really encouraging yeah just keep throwing shit at the wall eventually it all makes sense yep that's my uh, advice okay so where can they find you uh, Trey Lewis music on Instagram. Um, and then I think that we, and Twitter's at Trey Lewis music. And then we changed, uh, I think Facebook and all that's just Trey Lewis. Um, but my TikTok is at Trey Lewis music. Um, my website, Trey Lewis music.com. Um, we have all kinds of Dick Down in Dallas merchandise on there. I actually just put out a song about mental health. It's called Little Tired. If you buy one of those T-shirts, $15 of it goes to um, a treatment center in Alabama called Turning Point. So we have merchandise and our tour dates and all that stuff on the, on the website. So. Amazing. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.